to make people understand the market economy has been my effort for a very long time. I've thought a great deal indeed about the best method to be pursued to achieve that object. And I've devoted not only a great part of my research to an attempt to put the argument in a more convincing form, but I'll take my part in the organization of uh, intellectual activities by bringing to life an institution like the Mont Pelerin Society and other institutions trying to do what seemed to be impossible, but particularly Joseph Schumpeter regarded as impossible, to make people understand that to preserve a favorable institution was desirable. But the great problem in this is whom exactly to address. Indeed, there are two distinct tasks which people do not usually clearly distinguish. We want on the one hand to provide the business community with arguments to defend their position. And we want on the other hand, which is a quite different task, to persuade the intellectuals, the people who make public opinion, to understand and persuade and to under, uh, defend the free enterprise system. To me, the latter task seems in many ways the more important, but also the more neglected. For a fairly obvious reason, the development in the field of providing the businessman with arguments which he can use to persuade the politicians is a task which is near to the heart of the businessman and it's of course he from whom we count on the funds which we need to organize such an effort. But it is more important to convince the makers of opinion. <coughs> and they are not the businessmen, but they are a wholly different class. <coughs> the class which I, many years ago, in a phrase which seems to have caught on, which usually are called the intellectuals, which are then called the second-hand dealers in ideas. I must say I do not particularly like that class, which in my private language I call the I.I.I.s, the irresponsible, ignorant intellectual. <laughs> but they are, whether we like them or not, of decisive importance for the development of humankind. It is they whom we must persuade if we are to create a state of opinion which makes possible what we wish, because they who in turn educate the public. Now I think we, even if we dislike them, because at least in my lifetime, the efforts have been almost invariably directed in the wrong direction, they are mostly people of goodwill. And although it uh, requires a certain amount of self-control in a friendly and uh, manner to persuade people whom one dislikes, I think it is one of our main purpose to persuade this class because it's in their hands to determine what the general public will think in not very distant time. I'm afraid in this respect all I mean by intellectuals are people who are not experts in one particular subject, but who flatter themselves to be generally educated and to convey general information, I include even a great many of my economist colleagues, not when they talk about technical economics, but when they pass on 
the practical conclusions which they present derive from their technical economics to the general public, because I shall have occasion to say in a moment, once you pass beyond the task of explaining particular kinds of events, but begin to recommend uh, certain policies or certain social orders, you step far beyond the limits of economics. And one of the faults of economists in our time, about since the date when they called themselves economists and no longer political economists, was that they may have been great experts in the technicality of explaining the mechanism of the market, but were thoroughly simply boring that philosophical background, that those moral conceptions which you have to use in order to come to any conclusions on practical affairs from a field for which not only knew little, but for which they had a certain contempt. They had an idea, fostered by factors, which I shall in a moment consider, that of course the aims of social policy were obvious and clear to every good man, and all they had to do was to provide a substitutable technique to achieve these particular ends. Now this applies in particular to those American pseudo-liberals who, as Schumpeter said, have uh, as a supreme but unintended compliment the as enemies of private enterprise, thought it wise to appropriate the level, level liberal, which once in intellectual history meant the defenders of free enterprise, but in America has become the name of the enemies of free enterprise. I must add that what puzzles me most is not that these people were clever enough to do this, but that the so-called American conservatives let them get away with it. One of the silliest things in American history, I don't know how it could happen, that they were permitted to call themselves liberal, and even the so-called American conservatives, who in their tradition were really liberals, adopted their terminology, and now using liberal as a curse word, which in this country it very nearly has become. Now, while the refutation of all the suggestions to replace a free enterprise system by some other system of central direction, mostly central planning of one sort or another, while the system can be refuted only by good deal of understanding of technical economics and the advance of socialism has been greatly assisted by the lack of such an understanding, especially by the wrong belief that what people have done in the past determined prices instead of understanding that prices are the signal which tells people what they ought to do. But I'm afraid it is not possible definitely and conclusively to refute socialism on purely economic grounds. The problem is as much a moral problem as it is an economic problem. And as a result of a regrettable confusion, Economists, and not only economists who were biased in a socialist direction, but economists in general became rather afraid of speaking openly about the moral problems involved. They have been impeded, or we have been impeded, or allowed ourselves to be intimidated and disarmed by the objection that socialism cannot be 
refuted scientifically because the ultimate difference is a difference on value judgments and on value judgments science had nothing to say so therefore we ought to shut up and just tell people what was the relation of cause and effect but once we step beyond this or at least once a defender of the free market stepped beyond that he was stepping outside his proper field and offending against the basic canon of scientific procedure of course no socialist ever felt constrained to leave out value judgment from his argument but if value judgments occurred in any critical analysis of socialism, Thingus was appointed, oh, he is no longer a scientist. He's become a moralist and tries to impose upon us uh, moral views which we do not share. Now, this involves a confusion. Of course, it is true that from a purely factual from purely factual premises or statements about cause and effect and nothing else. No conclusions can be drawn about what is desirable. But of course, with people with whom we do not agree on certain ultimate value, we cannot discuss anything. Any discussion about what sort of social order is desirable or not, involves some agreement between the discussing people about at least some ultimate values. But once such a basis of discussion is established, such a basis which is required to make any discussion at all possible, and your premises contain not only statements of fact, but also certain values with whom you agree with your opponents, an infinite number of value conclusions follow from your premises. And in such a discussion, it's nonsense to say you cannot draw any value conclusions, but all discussions about policy must involve value conclusions. The situation is that all discussions on a desirable social order on the manner of how we should organize our affairs must start out from certain agreed values and will very soon arrive at what to the economist is really his daily brain the fact of conflict of values in fact I'm inclined to claim that by his occupation, the economist becomes the expert in the analysis of conflicts of value. It is our daily bread. What we constantly do, pointing out that the various things at which people aim are not all compatible, and that we must tell our audience that if you want A, you cannot have B, and so on. Discussion begins by introducing values, which of course you have explicitly to introduce and to state, and then the process must be one of pointing out that the various values which people, which guide people's hopes and aims, are not all compatible. In particular, it can be shown of this I am convinced that that self-generating division of labor, which since Adam Smith we know is the basis of our wealth, the foundation which gives us the means, which makes it possible even, to consider other things than the dire needs of daily life, are based on certain moral beliefs without the observance of which such a society would be altogether impossible. Indeed, we would be very poor if we could not count on the fact that as a framework of human action, 
all people we need to take into account are guided by certain basic moral principles, among which <coughs> such things as a respect for another person's property, the duty of keeping contracts, in fact, in short, what the traditional private and criminal law provide and have put into legal forms, are the basic moral rules on which our society rests, on which our productivity depends, and which, if we didn't recognize it, would destroy that wealth from which you hope to take in order to improve the position of those people who are well off. But of course the sad fact is that many so-called good people want to impose on public life other morals, morals which are clearly incompatible with a working market society and which are in a way inherited or derived from a much earlier primitive society of the small groups in which people were working, not for serving unknown people somewhere, but when it was thought the only good you could do was to serve the known needs of your known fellow men. These good people who uh, never understood how a market economy works had the conception that to be socially beneficial you had to serve known particular needs of particular other people and everything which was not thus guided was immoral and antisocial. Thus branding as immoral and antisocial, the foundation on which our whole wealth, our riches, and in fact the possibility of increasing population to the numbers which is had re reached, uh, is based. Uh, an attempt to enforce on modern society this belief that if you want to be socially beneficial, you have only to do the sorts of things where you see that you are benefiting known other people. And you must never be guided merely by the signals of the market, which tell you how you can produce something cheaply and find buyers who recompense you for them, would be a destruction of that order of society on which we all rely, which produces the wealth on which we live. Now, I cannot go into a detail of the a detailed analysis of the sort of uh, uh, moral views which undoubtedly very largely guide that class which I have briefly described as the intellectuals. When you want to say, make one few observations on this. During the early centuries of a nationwide or worldwide market society, public opinion was governed by the then successful class of producers and artisans and merchants and peasants who had a personal experience of the market and had learned to accept the rules and the morals of the market and obeyed them as a matter of course. Modern development has created a large educated class or a class which claims to be educated, which knows a great deal indeed in many fields, who completely lack this acquaintance with the morals of the market, with the rules which govern the market, and they fall inevitably back on the inherited morals of the Stone Age, of the time when men lived in tribes of 50 people or so, 
and the obvious duty of each was to serve the needs of his known fellows. And that large class, who has no ex direct experience of the market, has in here inherited no other morals than that, and wants to impose these primitive morals on a society which rests on a wholly different moral conception, that moral conception which has largely arisen by the process of evolution and election, uh, selection, by the fact that certain commercial centers have flourished because people have acquired what we now contemptuously call commercial morals. They have flourished, and gradually the world has imitate, been imitating these commercial morals. For a long time, all the people who accepted them were people who themselves knew how it works and couldn't conceive anything else. But in modern times, you have this new class, roughly the class which I call the intellectuals, who completely lack that experience, whose only morals are the inherited instincts which come back from previous ages, and who, in the best will and intention, believe that in order to be good or moral, you have deliberately to serve the needs of some other particular people whom you know. That the whole market system, the whole international division of labor, has grown up because people were enabled by the sim uh, symbols of price signals of prices to serve the needs of people whom they didn't know at all and to use for that purpose resources of people of whom they did not know anything else is completely unintelligible to those uh, very intelligent people who just do not know how the modern economy works and who combine and uh, I can even hardly call it traditional <coughs> an inherited and ingrained morals with an intellectual conception that they must construct a world which corresponds to these traditional moral needs, <coughs> and two of those led to suppose that uh, we construct different kinds of society where we can see that every effort aims at the satisfaction of a known human need, and everything is arranged to satisfy the mind of some supervising superior head. Now the rules which in fact serve to make the market possible and which lead to the formation of an order in which the chances for everyone are as good as they can be made possible, requires indeed uh, not only an understanding of a mechanism, it requires approval of a kind of activity which admittedly is not guided by wanting to do good to particular people, but which by observing the traditional practices of the market does no more than add to the pool of output <coughs> becomes available to the people. <coughs> <coughs> to put it briefly, a system we have really developed is uh, the result of the mechanism of the economy which, uh, from which we profit and gain all the time is a result of mankind having learned to play a game according to certain rules <coughs> which utilizes a maximum of knowledge but the products of which are unintended, unforeseeable and can therefore not be made to confirm to conform to any preconceived system of what different people ought to have. The whole idea that society ought to aim 
at a system of distribution which conforms to something which people call social justice is a meaningless claim. Social justice is a concept which is all right in a small organization where the head determines what each ought to have. But in a society where the direction of individual efforts depends on what prices tell people to do, the results must be undesigned, unintended, and therefore cannot possibly be just. To demand a just distribution is to demand the destruction of our type of society. Now, once I put it this way, I think you will be fully aware that today probably the majority of the people living in the industrial world, in fact, dislike the existing society, condemn it for being unjust, and want to remodel it in a form which would destroy its very existence. Now, there's still a hope of altering this trend, or what will be our fate, if we are in fact governed by a majority of people, and I don't think there's any question that the majority of people hold this idea that things should be so arranged that each gets what he deserves in some superior manner, if the view of these people are enforced. Is there still time to reverse the trend? Or are we bound to go the way which in the in a book which appeared in the same year of the Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and at that time had a much greater success than the Wealth of Nations. Edward Gibbon's work was stated very clearly with result to Athens. I think we might substitute in the sentence I shall read you any modern country for Athens. What he did say then in 1776, that in the end, more than they wanted freedom, they wanted security. They wanted a comfortable life, and they lost it all. Security, comfort, and freedom. When the Athenians finally wanted not to give to society, but for society to give to them when the freedom they wished, when they wished for, wished for most, was not the freedom from, uh, to do what they liked, but freedom from responsibility. Then Athens ceased to be free. Now when Gim wrote this, it was of course meant as a warning of what would happen if already visible tendencies were allowed to continue. We did not hate this warning. I think we are much nearer that state which Gim described. You will probably ask now whether I still have any hope, whether I am still optimistic that we can alter this trend reverse it as we must, if we are to preserve a society which gives the large population which has grown up an adequate income and prevents that sort of decline which is bound to be brought about by the destruction of the social order, which is bound to lead to social war, destruction and the ending of civilization. I'm afraid the answer to this question must be that my personal feeling varies a great deal. When as now happens so frequently, I'm taken around to meet young men who work essentially in the same direction as I do, I'm greatly encouraged. In this respect, 
<coughs> the situation has indeed fundamentally changed. <coughs> when I was a young man, a student, or not, not much beyond it, it was only some very old man who believed in the sort of free order which we call 19th century liberalism. My generation, and even the one following it, didn't want to have anything to do with it. Now, you won't find any old people, or hardly any, who believe in that. But it is, and not only in this country, Wherever I go, a group of young people who have rediscovered these truths were trying to spread them, and if they are given enough time, may succeed in reverting the trend. But I'm afraid you're probably aware that my view of the world is very biased and optimistic as a result of my being taken to meet these particular groups which are being organized everywhere. I have other experiences occasionally which make me very pessimistic indeed. Four weeks ago, as I passed through New York, I visited one of the most elegant bookshops there, Brentanos, a kind of bookshop which the intellectuals who write the New York Times and similar journals read. And after looking for an hour, it's the sort of book that our present intellectuals read, I'm afraid I lost every hope at all. <laughs> if that is the diet on which the people are being educated who write the New York Times and similar papers, how are we to hope? of any reversal of the course. I think the situation is still that my generation and the one immediately below mine, which means today, say, the people between 40 and 80, are almost completely hopeless. They are two lost generations so far as the future of the mankind is concerned. And the problem is whether we can postpone and delay the collapse which would be inevitable if their opinions continue to dominate long enough for a new generation to take over power, for that new generation of which I am afraid a not inconsiderable fraction is at this moment in this room and which is numerically still uh, very limited and restricted. But which and that is the hopeful part of it? Exists in every country of the world which I've been visiting in recent years, whether it be England or Germany or Japan or the United States or even Central America. I found everywhere for the first time in my long life real interest amongst the young, a few people who try to assist the young, and I think there's some hope, only some hope, that what is growing up there may get into power in time to prevent the destruction of our civilization. Thank you.